Thank you very much, Greg, and uh, good morning to all of you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here at the Dalalana School of Public Health, which, of course, I had many friends and colleagues, but it's my first visit. So it's, it's a real honor to be here and to share this work with you. Um, well, the title, of course, is on universal health coverage in Mexico, and I will be presenting to you uh, various pieces of work most of which done by colleagues and, and some of the research I have done myself on the, on the subject. Looking first at health needs, then looking at a broad view of Mexico's health system, uh, financial protection funding and, and demand, then a, a view on health impact and effective coverage of, of the system to, to look at the, what is actually happening on the ground. And then finally, very briefly, to have some reflections on where we are at in terms of universal health coverage and some of the challenges, especially looking at governance. So, of course, um, oops, I forgot to translate this one. I thought I had translated it, but, um, well, it's going to be in Spanish. <laughs> but, uh, uh, of course, all of you know, I'm sure, the, the three dimensions of universal health coverage, which is to get all of the population covered uh, with an essential uh, hopefully a broad package of, of interventions with effective coverage that are free at the point of, of uh, re or, or receiving them so, so as to reduce financial obstacles. And of course, this broad view of universal coverage, um, it, its origins are in, in, the, um, in the beverage report and its BIVAN implementation in 1947 in the UK when the slogan was made for a, a free healthcare system for all. So, it is a challenge to, to implement such a view in, in, throughout the, the world, and of course it has some maybe even ideological limitations to the concept, but it's certainly a concept that I have embraced, and that uh, in Mexico, indeed, health policy has embraced it also since 2000 at least, following WHO's leadership on the subject. So with, with those caveats, let, let's then look at, at health needs, and of course Mexico is undergoing and has indeed undergone an epidemiological transition, closely um, based on, on its demographic transition. For 2030, um, adults 65 and older will, have, will increase by 69% with respect to 2015. So it's a very, very fast demographic uh, transition. And today, uh, in the this is the picture we had in, the, in, the, in 1990, in terms of chronic diseases accounting for 44% of the disability adjusted life years, uh, painted in blue, as against the, the, the um, uh, infectious and, and reproductive problems painted in, in orange, pink, and, and the violence. But today, uh, in 2016, of course, we're up to 78% of, of the DALIs being for chronic diseases. This is a very fast change. That is uh, to which the Mexican health system has to adapt, and it's certainly today not keeping up to the challenge. Our system was very much designed in the 1930s, 1940s, to tackle mainly infectious diseases through a very vertical approach, and the challenge is how to horizontalize that and to make sure that we have the, the right uh, networks and, and person-centered health systems to address uh, such, a, such a challenge. So indeed, um, in, in, in pink, again, you have the infectious and reproductive health issues. You can see in the 1990s, diarrheal diseases, other non-communicable uh, and neonatal disorders at the top. And today, the seven uh, chief uh, causes of, of, um, of the burden of disease have to do with chronic diseases. And uh, diarrheal disease is, is all the way down to to, to position number 12. So indeed, it was a completely turnaround in the health system. Here um, in this graph, what I have done is try to do some projections as to where we will be in terms of chronic diseases in the near future. And in, in, blue, in the blue line, it's the average OCDE rate of, of chronic diseases in terms of DALIs per 100 individuals. And indeed, what we see is that uh, through effective interventions, the average in the OCDE is, has lowered and perhaps has bottomed out at 8.43 rate per, per 100 uh, disability adjusted life years. 
But in Mexico, what we're seeing in, uh, is a very fast increase associated not only to the transition, but of course to ineffective interventions and to um, a high burden that could be avoided. And the question is, where are we going to, are we going to be in 2020 when, according to this projection, which is very robust, uh, we could either f bottom out on the average of the OCD, or indeed we could even in continue increasing to the rate that the OCD countries have seen in the past, which of course is highly feasible. So those are the challenges in terms of addressing health needs that we need to, to, to look forward. And uh, I, I just wanted to, to um, emphasize that in terms of extreme poverty, Mexico has made progress uh, since 2000 to 2005, we have seen um, the percentage of extreme poor in Mexico decrease. These are two different poverty lines. Uh, the, the, the one at uh, $3 per day or the one at one point or nearly $2 per day. And indeed, th those, that's significant progress that indeed is a, a determinant of health that has to be addressed. So indeed, in general, extreme poverty has been abated, although poverty as such is still a big problem with close to uh, half of the population either in poverty or in extreme poverty. But indeed, uh, some progress has been made through safety net programs and uh, socioeconomic development in general. <clears throat> and also, um, financial protection has been increased, and uh, that's where I'm going to be focusing more. So basically, we, we see three situations here. Uh, at the top, lack of access to social security. Social security, of course, defined as a broad range of benefits, including pension funds and disability and so forth. And the lack of access to food, uh, also uh, decreasing uh, slightly, perhaps, between 2008 and 2015. But this blue line is, is access to essential health services, which is the one that has been make, make, making greatest progress, thanks to specific programs such as Seguro Popular, which is where I'm going to be talking about more now. So um, Mexico's health system is very unique in the world, I have to emphasize. It, it did have some similar systems in Latin America that have evolved, that have changed away from this model, such as was uh, Brazil until the 1980s, Colombia until the 1990s, Chile uh, also. But those systems have moved towards more integrated uh, arrangements. What we have in Mexico is a series of pillars of systems in terms of integrate institutions such as IMSS, that's a Mexican Institute of Social Security, that integrates funding, provision, and indeed demand in so far as, the, the, in this case, the private sector formal workers are affiliated um, through an obligatory arrangement of contributions deducted from, the, from their wages and where the, the employer and the employee contribute as well as the, the government. The government provides one-third tax funding for, for this pillar, and employees and employers uh, one-third, um, well, uh, the, the two-thirds in, in different proportions according to income. Importantly, then, the, the demand for, for these services is, is, there is no choice. You, you are given a set of uh, hospitals and primary health services to which you, you are forced to, to demand if indeed you want to make use of your contributions in terms of services. And uh, uh, of course there are virtues in this system insofar as it's obligatory, it's a government funding, it, it has a, a, a well-structured tiered health system that enables uh, to, to develop on a more or less rational manner services. But indeed, the, the issue is that it is fully integrated in, the, in that there is no choice, little flexibility for uh, demand, but also little flexibility in terms of moving policy forward, given the, the government-centered nature, uh, and I should say, within still a, 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 an authoritarian system of government for health, in spite of the fact that Mexico's poli a political system has been evolving very quickly to, towards greater democracy since, since at least 2000, when the first opposition president uh, came into, into office. But within health, we have seen little, if any, change whatsoever. Now, uh, this system, of course, IMSS, 
covers about uh, half of the population. East is the same arrangement for federal employees. Then you have smaller systems for the oil industry, state workers, uh, bureaucrats, I should say, and uh, for the armed services. And then you have this new pillar of Seguro Popular, which is what Julio Frank, as Minister of Health, introduced in the 2000s, precisely to try to emulate this kind of arrangement for the non-insured, not so much in terms of uh, developing an integrated system or, or a, a vertically integrated, but the emulation in terms of having secure funding for that population, having a, a defined package of health services and enabling that population to, to raise its level of, of uh, health care access and so forth, as indeed is what we have seen. And, and then you have, of course, the private health sector, which uh, today it's very important, but it, it's, it's a different pillar, although not integrated, has some private insurance, most of it funded out of pocket, and indeed uh, with private providers and uh, the, uh, the only, in this case, the uninsured and the, and the dissatisfied and the uninsured are free to choose to an extent, especially within Seguro Popular. Uh, there are some provisions to, to separate functions, although um, not, not all of it. So we, with that in mind, then um, what, um, I, well, I just wanted to give you a broad view of, of what, in terms of health systems types, we are at. So uh, state systems such as Cuba in Mexico is M a a to, an, a to a large extent the Ministry of Health as a national health service for the non-insured with, with some limitations. Societal democratic uh, with a decentralized plural and autonomous system perhaps with Germany as an example. And then societal authoritarian, uh, I, I say this is Mexico especially with, with IMSS and the private arrangement which is of course uh, typical in the U.S., uh, but in, in Mexico with the private system. So in Mexico, then, we have the, the various institutions are modeled after different uh, national systems, if you wish, in, in terms of prototypes, making it a very complex mix of services to, to be able to, to manage and to, to develop. Now, here I try very quickly to uh, compare IMSS as against Seguro Popular in terms of uh, coverage, um, uh, intervention coverage, the charter, governance, financing, organization, official coverage, and spending per capita. I will not go into the details, but again, I, I said that Seguro Popular tried to emulate to an extent the kind of arrangement, the kind of architecture that IMSS had been able to develop since the 1940s. IMSS, of course, for the private salaried workers following that integrated system, vertically integrated system, um, anyone uh, with capacity to pay uh, the coverage is uh, I, I, oh, oops, a, a little, sorry, this line here should have been to the right. Uh, IMSS, of course, affiliates um, in an obligatory manner the salary workers as against a group popular, which is anyone with capacity to pay uh, that is not insured. Uh, the coverage in IMSS is a full package with a very few explicit exclusions as against Seguro Popular, which includes 285 essential and 60 high cost interventions. Um, by design, those interventions should have covered up to, in primary care, up to 90% of all needs, and in, in hospital care, up to 85%. In some evaluations we have undertaken recently, we have seen that in fact hospital care is only covered up to 65% of, of needs. The, the remaining 35% uh, uh, people still have to pay out of pocket, and of course, it's for conditions that are not included in the package. So there are still some challenges of, of, of in terms of vertical coverage of that issue. Um, the constitutional charter is very different. Labor law in, in, in the IMS, this is a charter by, by in terms of a worker's right, uh, it's a system that originated in the protection against accidents and occupational disease, and that was extended then towards the general health. But it, then the whole legal framework is fully separate from the health framework that embraces the Seguro Popular, which is a more in terms of the right to health, that is a, a right in Mexico, but which IMSS doesn't really address. IMSS is set up on a different 
charter in terms of the right to workers' protection for, for labor and, and, and health issues. Therefore, the governance of IMSS is very different to that of Seguro Popular. Um, and indeed, here we are talking about who governs 54 million people, 44% uh, of the population, as against 57 million for Seguro Popular. And here, because it is based in labor law, it, IMSS was established as a tripartite system in 1943. Tripartite contribution, which I have mentioned, government, uh, government, employees and employers, but also in governance, IMSS is, is governed through the same tripartite arrangement, not only as a consultative assembly, which indeed it has, but as an executive. All executive decisions, high level, such as approving the budget, developing it, uh, t making major decisions, are taken by a tripartite executive board, or consejo técnico. Now that, uh, that tripartite board is made up of trade union representatives and employer representatives. Now it so happens today, the, of, of the mass of 54 million affiliated workers, only 12% are trade unionized. And the trade unions that are actually governing uh, IMS represent only 2% of all affiliates. So those are major issues of representation. They go all the way back to the 1940s, an authoritarian system, much closer to, to the health systems of, of Italy and, and, and Spain at the time. I won't say any more about what they were at the time, because if I pronounce those words in Mexico, I'm not very popular. <laughs> but they, th that's how the, the system was shaped, through corporations that came together to, to in many ways, ignore paper over class differences and to try to develop a, a more harmonious way of governance, but in fact, uh, today, very much to the detriment of healthcare decision making, which has to be looking at chronic diseases and in many other ways. So, um, here in, in this rather detailed graph, I, I will try to be very quick. Uh, Julio Frank, as Minister of Health, he justified the developing Seguro Popular as uh, so, uh, that other pillar to, to strengthen the uninsured in terms of, uh, of addressing five uh, financial imbalances that affected that population. The first was insufficient health spending. The second, excessive out-of-pocket expenditure. The third, insufficient state government spending on the non-insured. The fourth, inequitable public spending. And the fifth, high operational spending. So we have assessed the situation between 2000 and 2012. By 2012, the promise was to have extended universal coverage, or at attained universal coverage nationwide. So um, in terms of the first in imbalance in sufficient health spending, Seguro Popular was able to push spending upwards from 5 to 6.2% of GDP. In terms of excessive out-of-pocket expenditure, again, uh, to an extent due to Seguro Popular, but also to lowering uh, the prices of, of uh, drugs uh, through the introduction of generics into the market and also the decreasing of private care expenditure uh, associated to the generic medicines. Um, Out-of-pocket came down from 55 to 45 percent of total health expenditure. Now 45 percent, which remains today, is still a very high figure for a country such as Mexico. We will see a little bit more about that. Insufficient state government expenditure was not uh, successful. We are still um, at, a, at, a, at a deficit because indeed, in fact, state expenditure decreased. It should have increased. Inequitable public spending was a, a big success in terms of uh, increasing the per capita expenditure for the non-insured vis-a-vis the insured. And the high operational spending, uh, again, not a success. Investment in health uh, for the non-insured, but also for the insured, has, been, uh, uh, has maintained at very low levels. So we're, sp we're investing in infrastructure in our system, less than 2% of national health expenditure, which given the epidemiological transition, of course, is a big challenge, because uh, in indeed, uh, transforming the health system is a question of investing in infrastructure in terms of developing more primary health services, transforming hospitals, 
renovating, but also increasing hospitalization capacity for chronic diseases. All of that has only has pretty much been kept at the same level. Now, another big issue, and this is only a, like a video I'm going to be showing you here. It shows the complexity of the system. These are the various pillars, IMS, ISTE, Seguro Popular, with various levels of integration in terms of services, in terms of funding and sources. But uh, in theory, each uh, source of funding is pretty much funding IMS or ISTE uh, as such. Uh, each is, has, in theory, its own arrangement. However, um, as we have moved into, uh, in, into the, within the framework of universal health coverage, the government has attempted to integrate the system through developing funding flows across, across the pillars without actually changing the pillars. So what happens, in fact, and, and just keep moving the, the various allocations just to come to the final one, which, and this is the final one. The final one is a huge, very complex web of interrelationships in terms only of funding, where each institution is trying to fund the others as, as it tries to, to develop, a, for example, integrating hospitals so that a, a, an IMSS hospital provides services also for the non-insured and so forth. And, and, but in, without, true, without having incentives on the ground in terms of developing, for example, allowing each hospital to manage its own funds. So if hospitals are not autonomous in that respect, if they don't have any risk in terms of, of fund holding, then they have very little incentive to, to either offer services outside or to send their own patients outside. And, and so those are very formal ways of interrelating and that have been not only very complex, but also very slow to move in, given those, uh, that lack of incentive. So what is the situation in terms of financial protection for health? Today, with a population of 122.3 million, we have a, a complex arrangement. Here, we have without financial protection, 14.6% of the population, according to the latest uh, survey of 2016 survey of employment and occupation, which allows us to see what uh, the population tells us in terms of access to services. Uh, private insurance, 2.1% of the population. However, uh, private insurance also covers some uh, employees of IMSS and ISTE, those high level employees, basically um, decision makers and, and functionaries of firms and so forth. So private insurance has up to 7.8% of insurance. Then social security without this 5.7%, 32.3% only with Social Security. Seguro Popular and Social Security, and there's an overlap which in, by law shouldn't happen, but in fact, labor mobility is so high that it's difficult for that overlap not to exist. And Seguro Popular, 39.1%. So several challenges in terms of interrelationships of, of insurance holding or policy holding, and in terms of the non-insured, truly enabling them to, to to all of them to have some insurance. That 14.6%, about half is poor population and half are self-employed. Because if Seguro Popular is voluntary, the self-employed do not have all the incentives to affiliate because in fact, they can free ride in the system and be affiliated and only at the last moment when they get hospitalized. Now, um, in terms of um, looking at financial protection, who has IMS and who has social security. These are income quintiles, the poorest and the richest, and this is the total population. And we clearly see that social security clearly benefits those that are better off. And uh, we, we need to remember that social security, IMS in particular, is funded uh, one third through general taxation, meaning that the, the taxes are being um, are, are being regressive in terms of who they are benefiting in, 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 in for social security at least. Now, um, this presents uh, some research we, we are just publishing now in terms of looking at the labor market and coverage for IMS. And um, what we see is that the labor market is not as segmented today 
as it used to be in the 1940s when that institution was established. Uh, in the 1940s, it was said, okay, all salaried uh, private sector employees will have uh, to contribute by force. They will be provided with these services and the hospitals and the health centers will be uh, developed or built close to the communities and so forth. Then the, the expectation was that private uh, salaried workers, once they, they gained such employment coming from the countryside, from the peasantry and so forth, that they would keep such employment and that the, labor, the formal labor market would be growing until it would cover all of the population. No, that not only is the case today, because indeed we have half of only of the coverage and of the labor market. In fact, lo less than the labor market is, is formal, about 40% only, 60% is informal, uh, including, of course, self-employed. And not only that, but also the, the two um, segments are very uh, uh, porous. They, they, they are not fixed. Many people cross over every year. So what we did here was we analyzed the cohort of EAMS affiliates. We asked uh, in January uh, 2014, what was the roster of, of those affiliated at EAMS? And through a panel survey of the labor and occupation survey, the, the, the same families were asked every trimester, what is your insured situation? So at the end of the year, at least 38% of affiliates had lost the right to, to receive health care from IMSS at least once and, and up to 6% twice during the year. So we're talking here population that is either, uh, it's unstable either because it's seasonal work or because they are temporary workers or because they are se seeking opportunities in, in the uh, informal labor market and less so because they, they continue studying or they become uh, home workers or house makers. So indeed, it's a very unstable market and, and we're going to see important health consequences of that instability. But imagine yourselves, you're a doctor in your office, you have, let's say, 1,000 um, families to look after in the year. At the end of that year, 38, 380 of those 1,000 families, you may, not, you may well not have continued seeing, treating for their diabetes, their hypertension, their, their problems, because they lost the right to, to access IMSS because they moved from the labor market. So today, this is why we're, we're emphasizing the importance of delinking the relationship between access to health services and your position in the labor market so that you're able to maintain continuity regardless of who is paying for your health care. And indeed, I want to emphasize that today because Seguro Popular is covering most of the primary care interventions as IMSS covers, then there is no reason why the same government could not be funding both providers so that you keep, keep continuity. However, because of the inefficiency of the system in terms of IMSS, that monopoly of provider, their prices have gone up very high and many primary care interventions are paid uh, at twice or three times the rate or they cost, because there is no market really, but they, the actual cost of such interventions is higher. So indeed, as I showed in, the, in terms of the exchanges, IMSS has no incentive to actually take up those employees in Seguro Popular or, or persons in Seguro Popular because uh, Seguro Popular would be paying them less than they, they would actually be expecting. But indeed, un until you open up to a market, a provider market in that respect, you, will, you won't have the, the, be able to compare truly what the costs are and to introduce incentives for efficiency in, in, on both to, to all providers. So in terms of funding, indeed Mexico has been increasing the per capita expenditure fairly steadily until 2013, 2014. Uh, 2015, which is not shown in the graph, we actually saw the first um, decrease in actual per capita, per capita expenditure in decades in Mexico uh, due to the economic crisis and other phenomena. But in general, the, there has been a steady increase and the, that gap shows the gap between the social security per capita funding and the non-insured, uh, basically funding through Seguro Popular. And in the 2000, we had a nearly three times difference 
and today it, was, it has been reduced to 1.6 difference, which is still important because, it, it, um, for example, it's uh, interventions that are not funded by Seguro Popular and that are critical for the population include um, um, uh, infarto agudo, I can never say that in English, which is a heart attack, but uh, they are not covered, and they, so, uh, or I should say they are covered only until age 60. But we know that the prevalence of heart attack is much higher from 60 onward. So for practical purposes, they are not covered. Many cancers are not covered. Some are, for example, breast cancer, um, uh, prostate cancer, uh, Child cancers are, are covered in many of them, but not adult cancers. So we still have um, needs that need to be covered. So that gap, unless it fully closes, will continue seeing um, imbalances. And indeed, given the trend that both are flattening out, and also in terms of the political economy, that gap will not likely close, given the fact that IMSS is, is the hegemonic institution. IMSS wants to retain as many of the former workers as it can, thus, um, in a way, not providing incentives for Seguro Popular, which would be covered in the informal sector. But of course, uh, there is this debate whether if, if you have a, a, a lower cost to many, for most people free service uh, that needs no contributions and that provides increasingly equal interventions, then that will, uh, that will be an incentive to maintain the labor market informal. And that has been a hypothesis that, that has been tested. To an extent, it's true only about 3% of, uh, of the expectation for, for formalization. In other words, only 3% of workers that should have been in the formal market remained in the informal market given the Seguro Popular incentive. Yeah, this, that's some modeling that has been done by, uh, through economic, econometrics and so forth. However, even, even so, policymakers, especially in today's government, PRI, are of the firm thinking that they should maintain Seguro Popular uh, punish, if you wish, as an incentive for uh, workers not to be in the informal sector. And, and not only workers, but also employers. To, to formalize their work. So I, what I say, it's a political issue. To what extent are you going to truly level uh, packages? And unless we change the architecture of the system so such incentives are not, are not there, that gap will remain and perhaps even may increase. Now, uh, looking in terms of the out-of-pocket uh, expenditure, which we mentioned, it's much higher than, than should be the case given Mexico's level of development. Uh, we see um, uh, the peak of out-of-pocket in uh, 2002, I should say, at 55% of total health expenditure, and then a steady decrease until about 2010, and today, again, flattening it out at about 44%. I already mentioned that out-of-pocket expenditure decreased both because of Seguro Popular, but also given lower costs for um, generic drugs and for medical consultations. That today there's a, a model of care called the pharmacy adjacent physician, which is uh, drugstores selling mostly generics, put a little room next to, to the pharmacy with a physician that writes prescriptions. Pretty much that's what they do. They, they also alleviate symptoms and indeed they have proven to be highly effective in reducing waiting times vis-a-vis uh, -vis public services in providing prescriptions that alleviate symptoms and that uh, at very low cost. So that is what is um, explaining perhaps both Seguro Popular and that model, explaining that um, important reduction. But today, given the OECD standards or the average of out-of-pocket is 19%, the average. So. Uh, what we have proposed is why doesn't Mexico go from 44% to 19% and that um, the, the, different, the difference in that expenditure ensure it in terms of either public insurance or complementary packages of services uh, provided through private health insurance 
uh, so that we, we incentivize prepayment in, in some form. So that, that, that's the big challenge today. Now, that out-of-pocket is affecting all inco income quintiles, from one the poorest to five the richest. We see that 45% of the volume of out-of-pocket expenditure is being borne by the, the income quintile from three to one is poverty, pretty much. So the poor are, are bearing 45% of the income of the, of the um, out-of-pocket, which means it's inequitable, clearly, very regressive in terms of its consequences. And of course, um, the, what we're trying to um, debate here is whether uh, out-of-pocket is truly enabling an option. Is it, is it something for the middle class to have an alternative source of care that, uh, that is with greater commodities and so forth? And no, what we see is that it, it is fu it's funding to a large extent essential care. Indeed, the private sector today provides 22% of hospital care in Mexico and up to 45% of all first uh, level care. So, uh, and that of course is fully out of pocket. So except for a tiny minority that is funded f through private insurance, because the private sector does not lend services to the public sector either, so given that uh, segmentation. Now, uh, in terms of catastrophic and impoverishing expenses, clearly, again, the two trends of Seguro Popular and of lower costs uh, for medicines and so forth has been important. Uh, Felicia Noll has been uh, very vocal. Uh, she's an economist doing this kind of work, and um, from a height of 4.5% of total households um, having catastrophic or impoverishing expenditures, that went down to 2% in, uh, in, in 2012 thereabouts, and it, again, it's flattening out. Uh, um, so we see trends already reaching their, their limit. So in terms of demand um, for services, I, we, I mentioned labor rotation, which implies that you lose access to IMSS, then you have to go and seek access from the private sector or indeed from Seguro Popular providers. But uh, if you take um, a picture at any one time, this is based on 2012 National Health Survey, uh, we see that across all institutions for primary care and also across all institutions for hospital care, we see that only between 65 and 66% of demand is actually placed within your given providers. The rest you have to pay out of pocket through going either to the private sector or to Seguro Popular, who will charge you out of pocket expenditures also. In hospital care, that is uh, between 75 to 82% that are actually using their own institutions. So um, it, this is only a photograph. Any person will be demanding private care at any point in time. And in fact, we've done another survey looking at chronic diseases uh, among adults in urban areas. And in a year period, uh, a high, about half of all chronic disease patients will have visited both a public provider and a private provider. So that is a challenge for continu continuity of care, um, for effectiveness, let alone the efficiency of care. So, uh, well, I have mentioned the provision of, uh, by the private sector and other providers. So what is the health impact of this? In terms um, of um, general and infant mortality rates, uh, we have seen that comparing the top quintile with the lowest quintile, income quintiles, we see that the, there is fairly a high degree of equity except for maternal and mortality care, which is still the mortality rates are still markedly higher in the lower quintiles given difficulties of accessing healthcare. So that's, that's still a, a big challenge. In terms of comparing municipalities with the, with the highest human development index against those of the lowest, which of course in Mexico is a huge difference, the highest uh, level, uh, for example, Benito Juarez in Mexico City, um, only um, three uh, per thousand, uh, uh, three, birth, uh, three mortality, infant mortality rate of three per thousand births as against 61. And looking at the state level, uh, Distrito Federal again, 13 as against 24. 
So these are differences that are, are huge in terms of you could either be in, 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 in a country in Africa or in Switzerland, in, in Mexico. So those are the differences that, that you see in, in a country such as Mexico with great inequality. Uh, and in terms of effective access, effective coverage, we see that here again we're looking at, at the differences, the relative gap between the, the less and the most affluent in terms of access to interventions. Uh, and we see for chronic diseases, such as uh, the mammogram or, or, or HPV vaccine, which of course prevents cervical cancer, which can be considered to an extent chronic, we see greater inequities than for the acute uh, treatment, especially preventable diseases. Again, Mexican health system has been successful in terms of reaching equity and lowering <coughs> mortality and so forth for acute diseases, but the big challenge is in chronic disease. Let me skip that one. And here we see the decay in effective coverage, uh, looking at the, from structural factors to, to quality of care. And we see that in Mexico, out of 100% of women between 40 and 69 years of age that should be um, screened every two years for a breast cancer, out of that 100, uh, there is capacity for screening only for 37%. And this is among Seguro Popular women. But I should stress the situation is not very different in EMS and other social security. So 37% capacity, 15% of women actually get their mastography performed, specialized evaluation for confirmation and pathology in time, only 2%, and only 1.2% of women will reach treatment with, and have been screened in time so that they reach treatment uh, and all, all stages uh, in, in a stage zero or stage one cancer. So here we see we're comparing women in, uh, again, uh, Seguro Popular women in green as against a comparable group in the US, which is Hispanic women in California, in terms of the percentage that are reaching uh, or entering treatment at, at, at different stages of the cancer. So uh, in Mexico, only 2.2 reach at uh, stage zero and 7.5 at stage one as against what could be expected, 18.2 or 30.1, in terms of better or even best practices uh, worldwide. So clearly huge differences, even within Seguro Popular, given the lack of, of a, a proper management incentives, looking at a population as a whole and so forth. So let me uh, just um, finish. And I, I do want to give you the chance to make a few questions, and I apologize. So where are we? in terms of, of universal coverage. Uh, I have mentioned some of these figures, about 15% gap in terms of the population with access to essential health coverage. Um, perhaps if we look at um, out of pocket, 57% uh, gap, if we're going to reach the 19%, I should say, um, the 19% the of total health expenditure spent out of pocket, which is the average of the OECDE countries. So we have that gap uh, in terms of out-of-pocket as a measure of, of free access at the point of care. And in terms of effective coverage, uh, given measures that I apologize, I have to skip some of them, but uh, we still have important gaps in actually attaining best standards. And my proposal is not to look at simply what you are offered in terms of an essential package of services, but effective access to such services. So the challenges are uh, in terms of health needs, which are increasing, and in terms of healthcare costs, which are also increasing, and to how to close that gap. Well, we need innovation, we need efficiency to attain universal health coverage. So we need to strengthen universal coverage policy as such, and, and indeed not weaken that stance. That's very important today. Uh, the government has shown signs of weakening that effort. We see flattening trends, and, and indeed at the level of discourse, we see people, uh, some kind of fatigue in terms of universal coverage. We need more effective networks, moving from, from that uh, vertical segmented approach uh, that ties access to, to, to the labor market towards more um, horizontal integration 
greater number of benefits, especially for Seguro Popular, government commitment and more efficient networks in terms of reducing costs and providing incentives, introducing competition into the system, uh, equitable and sufficient funding, and plural health provider networks, introducing uh, both within the public sector and introducing the private sector, which as I said, today is about half of, of demand for primary care is in the private sector. So there is no way it can be kept as a, a segmented, separate approach. So thank you very much. <laughs>